Now, in digital technologies, we don't have context per se as per the curriculum. There are contexts in designer technology, but not in digital technologies. But there are three broad contextual areas that we can frame the curriculum around, particularly around the development of student solutions to problems. Now, the first of these is coding. Then there's automation or robotics. And then the third is information-based context and their associated solutions that students use or develop problems develop solutions to problems around. So we need to remember that the focus is always around solving problems. So while we will teach students how to use various applications to help them solve problems, including programming languages, digital technologies is not about teaching them how to use particular tools, such as a programming language. Now we will do so but it is not the focus. We do so in order to enable them to learn various concepts and to be able to solve problems. So this is something that many digital technologies teachers get caught up in. Uh, they may find a great new application such as web development um, or a robotics kit and fall into the trap around teaching the particular tool or application or device as though it was a fundamental aspect of the subject. It's not. We can certainly use it, use it and incorporate it into teaching around the fundamental aspects that you'll find in the curriculum documents. But the focus is on students being able to solve problems through computational design and systems thinking, using a range of different um, capabilities that are developed through the content descriptors. So that said, there are a range of concepts that are developed through learning a programming language, coding. These are sequencing, selection, making choices, um, iteration or repetition, and modularity. Now, in years nine and 10, we also have a focus on developing some understanding of object-oriented programming. But none of this goes to the level of depth that you would in a programming course at university or at TAFE or in industry or even online, where you learn all the ins and outs and aspects of a particular programming language. In schools, we're learning sufficient about these applications, these tools, such as a programming language, to enable students to be able to apply them to solve problems, to do things. So they don't need to know all the elements of a programming language in order to be able to do that. And indeed, it's more beneficial if they don't, because then they can see programming languages as just tools and that they will learn a number of programming languages and different languages may be more effective at doing different things. If you're creating a solution to a problem that involves a web-based interface, then a programming language that is more designed for web-based tools, such as JavaScript, would be the most effective solution. If it's a relatively complex app-based um, application that needs uh, access to a range of libraries and uh, elements of that nature, then Python would be the more appropriate programming language. If it's programming a robot where it needs to have access to hardware and um, make those sort of calls, then a language such as C Sharp or C++ maybe the more appropriate programming language. And likewise, if it's a simple concept or a simple um, application, maybe a simple game or um, some sort of interactivity, then a block-based programming language would be the better tool for developing that in. If it's a much more complex program that goes beyond the capacity to visualize it on a single screen, then a text-based language is going to be more appropriate. Now that is why we tend to use block-based languages for the younger years, where the concepts and applications that they're developing are relatively simple. But once they start getting to a certain level of complexity, then a text-based language becomes more efficient and effective, and we move towards that. So in years nine and 10, it is expected that you start using text-based languages, not necessarily exclusively. If it's just a simple application or simple task, then a block-based language may be more appropriate. And likewise, if they're starting to develop quite complex 
um, applications in years seven and eight, then a text-based language is more appropriate to use in that circumstance. So you need to make those judgments. Okay, so there's the different applications and there's the different types of programming languages. Now we can use any programming language um, in teaching digital technologies, but there are certain ones that are more, um, more effective for beginners. So they're more um, forgiving around syntax and that's why we tend to use the block-based languages. Of course, that, in those languages, students are just dragging and dropping various um, commands and they don't have to worry about all the syntactical rules that are so important in text-based languages, where if you put a full stop or a bracket or a semicolon in the wrong spot, then it will stop the execution of the program. That's not necessarily a problem when you're using block-based languages. Now, beyond the creation of apps and applications, um, we then see more specialised areas of coding and programming. And the first of these is web-based, creating applications that run in a browser, um, or in some cases on a mobile device, which is the more commonly referred to um, app development environment. Then an app simply refers to an application, and a desktop application is also an application. So mobile apps um, used to be distinguished from desktop apps in that they were much smaller um, and simpler. Nowadays, though, there's very little difference between the complexity of mobile apps and desktop apps. And so they're really sort of falling within the same environment now. But applications that are designed to run through a web browser are different. Now, the simplest of these is uh, HTML-based um, web pages. That's generally taught in primary now. So you wouldn't be generally teaching um, web-based programming. You may do some complex uh, cascading style sheets and things of that nature, but more often now you will do things that integrate in with databases and have more specific programming code, such as JavaScript and things of that nature. So that's where you should be aiming to be moving your web-based programming in um, years seven to 10. Now, there are various tools and environments that can assist you in doing that, and I've given you some access to those on the course material. There's also integrated development environments, and we also need to teach students about hosting and how the internet works, how they host files on a server, and that provides access through various uh, routers and um, protocols that allow remote computers to get access to those files, be them HTML files in terms of a web server or other types of files in terms of file servers and, and things of that nature. So understanding how the internet works at a fundamental level, not an incredibly deep level, but they should, students should certainly be learning about routers and um, internet addressing and all of those aspects that make the internet work. And again, if you need some refreshers on that, I'll give you some um, video clips that you can look at to explore some of those fundamentals. So creating web pages, hosting um, web sites, and exploring some of the internet technologies such as hosted services, um, such as Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud Platform, are ways that students can learn about the internet <coughs> and how those processes work. There's also internet simulators that students can use, and there are shared collaboration environments such as GitHub, where st students can work collaboratively on tasks, programming tasks, because of online services. So these are things that can be explored as part of digital technologies. Now, the next area that we commonly use in teaching digital technologies is an area that engages students in the context of the programming. And this is around game development. Um, now, it doesn't involve the use of games for teaching, 
which is gamification and use of games in education, this is about students creating games. Now it's not about playing the games, which would go into the area of esports in schools. This is about students making the games. Now some of it can be using quite complex or simple um, game development environments which assist students in the programming and many of these have their own programming languages um, so the students don't have to use a more traditional programming language they use um, a language and a whole set of code libraries that relate specifically to game development now there's quite a few simple um, game development environments um, through to very complex ones such as unity and things of that nature so depending upon the level that you take students through will be de dependent upon uh, the environment that you utilize and many schools teach digital technologies through a game development approach where they start with simple game development and progress up to doing things in the more complex industry level um, game development environments Now, there's also the area of artificial intelligence, and this has its own coding and programming um, languages that allow specific approaches to uh, solving problems. And students should be learning or at least understanding that these exist and exploring some of the potential of this more specialized area of programming. Um, now, it's not formally in the curriculum at at the moment, but it certainly can be used as a context for learning programming, and it will most definitely be coming part of the curriculum over the coming years. So providing students with an understanding of how artificial intelligence works and how students can program their own artificial intelligence applications, be they simple chatbots through to image recognition um, programs and a whole range of other areas of artificial intelligence that students can explore. And again, I've given you some links to those.